This morning I would like for us to draw some lessons from the sixth chapter of the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 6. Before we look at some of the words found in this chapter, once again let us pray and Commit ourselves in the hands of our Lord Jesus Christ, the prophet of the church, that he might guide us in our study. So let us pray together. Our blessed Lord and Savior, we thank you and praise you for so great a salvation. And you have expressed that it is your will that we grow in grace and knowledge of you that by means of your truth our sanctification would be furthered, by means of your truth we would be equipped to be better servants. And so this day, as we look at your word, we ask that you would give to us humility of mind, and we acknowledge our desperate need of the Holy Spirit to guide us, that we might understand your word aright. And that, Lord God, we would see the implications of your truth in our daily lives, in our service to you. For your namesake, blessed Lord, we ask these things. Amen. The tulip. It is a very beautiful looking garden plant. It's believed that the tulip came up from southern Europe, southern Asia. Of course, when we think of the flower of the tulip, we can't help but think of the Netherlands. And indeed, the cultivation of tulips is a big industry in that country. Tulip bulbs go out across the world. And there is a place right here in the United States where the cultivation of tulips is a big business. It's called Holland, Michigan. And that's because there are a lot of Dutch people there. As I said, you find tulips in other places. Well, what about here in Phoenix? Well, if you would put out the tulip bulb early, and then early spring one might come up, but as soon as the temperature got up to 80 degrees, it's gone. They cannot stand the heat. And they would not be perennial here in the valley. On the other hand, you could go up to Flagstaff. It's cooler there. And you could find some beautiful tulips. Now, the word tulip in and of itself is a term that has been used in the church since about the... 15th century. In fact, there are people outside of our assembly who might refer to us as a, as a bunch of tulips. And in so doing, they would not be doing it in a very complimentary way. For you see, there are some who believe that those who call themselves tulips are mishandling the Word of God. The word tulip is a nickname for those doctrines taught in the Word of God that have to do with God and His salvation of sinners. Anachronism. Tulip. Total depravity. An unconditional election. A limited atonement. Irresistible grace. The perseverance of the saints. I'm not ashamed to say I'm a tulip if you really know what a tulip is. And sad to say, in this age of church ignorance, a lot of people don't. If they heard that we were tulips, they think, well, why would you call those people by the name of a garden flower? Well, we're not a bunch of garden flowers. We believe the doctrine set forth in the Word of God. And so this morning, we want to look at this T, total depravity. And so what do we mean when we say the sinner is totally depraved? Well, first and foremost, we simply mean that all men are sinners by nature. That's where we start. All men are sinners by nature. 
And so I will now read out of this sixth chapter uh, the first eight verses. It's a familiar section concerning Noah. Now it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born to them that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were beautiful and they took wives for themselves of all whom they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever for he is indeed flesh Yet his days shall be one hundred and twenty years. There were giants on the earth in those days, and also afterward when the sons of God came in to the daughters of men, and they bore children to them. Those were the mighty men who were of old men of renown. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping thing, and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Amen. Now this morning we will primarily be drawing some truths from that fifth verse. And in so doing, I think we need to consider the immediate preceding context. The immediate preceding context of this fifth verse. It's very obvious overall there's a terrible judgment coming. A very severe worldwide judgment. Well, what's bringing on this judgment? Well, you notice it speaks about in verse 2 about the sons of God and the daughters of men. So I interpret that to have reference to mixed marriage. In other words, you have the sons of Seth, those who profess the true religion, and they're marrying into the line of Cain, his sons, his daughters. And so there's this mixed marriage, and, and this provokes the Lord. And I know you can find some who say, well, these are angels, you know, and they marry the daughters of men and what. But you look in the context. Anything said about angels? One word about angels? And does that even make sense? But there are those who like to push that. and Oh, it's exciting to listen to. But then you go on and it speaks about these giants in the earth. And we hear the word giant, we think of someone of of great physical stature. But again, if we look at the verse, it seems it has reference to men of power, men of great authority and wealth. We use that terminology in the field of the computer. We would say, Bill Gates, he's the giant. And we would say that about other men in a particular vocation. He's the giant in that field. And so here you have men that are gigantic as far as power. There's a lot of cruelty. And then the Lord tells us what He saw. And so here's the immediate preceding context for this verse and for this judgment that is going to come upon the earth. The Lord will no longer, He will no longer strive with men about this matter. But then I would also like for us to go back and consider what we call the far context, the far preceding context. And in so doing, I go back to Genesis chapter 1. Then God said, Let us make man on our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in His own image. In the image of God, He created him. Male and female, He created them. And God blessed them. And God said, Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. and Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And then verse 31, And God saw everything that He had made, and indeed it was very good. Here is man, he's created, and God pronounces it's good. But we go over here. Then the Lord God saw the wickedness of man was great. What in the world has happened? 
from God saying it's good to God saying wickedness wickedness and then you have that figurative language I'm sorry and grieved it doesn't mean that God it's figurative language God setting forth how awful sin is and what He's going to do God's not sorry for anything God's not disappointed in anything God decreed all that came to pass and all that He has decreed He's very pleased with so here is this figurative language setting forth the awfulness of sin and then the greatness of His grace. And so here is this judgment that's coming. And look at man's... How did this come about? Well, when we bring in other Scriptures, we are told that this only have I found, says Ecclesiastes 7.29, God made man upright. He made him righteous. When God made man, He didn't make the man and then put some righteousness on him. He made the man righteous. It was in his whole being. He was a righteous man. He was a man made. The law of God was in his heart. We believe that. Well, as you go to Romans 2, it speaks about those who are fallen, those outside the pale of special revelation. They have the work of the law upon their hearts. Men know that certain things are wrong and certain things are right. Yes, because of the fall, the law is a little bit blurred. It's like if I take off my glasses, I can still read, I can make out words. Here's a little blurriness, but I know what it says. And men know what they ought to do. And man's affections, everything about the man was pro-God. His heart loved God. He had a true understanding of God in his mind. That's how God made man. But what happened? And God saw the wickedness. Well, there's that fall. By one man, sin entered into the world. And death passed upon all men. We all sinned in Adam. God made him our representative. And though it's disputed in Hosea, it speaks like men like Adam that have transgressed the covenant. And so when Adam sinned, we sinned. Just like recently, sadly. The sons lost to the spurs. What do died in the wool sons fans say? We lost. Well, you weren't out on that court. But we're identified with them. They represent us. We lost. When Adam sinned, we sinned. Or as the wise man said again in Ecclesiastes 7.29, This only have I found that God made man upright, but they have sought out many inventions. And so something happened. Man fell. He started off by saying all that he saw was good. Now what does God say? Then the Lord God saw. And you notice who is the witness here. It is God. It is God telling us what He saw. He's a very good witness. Now here some time back, on a news program, there was some discussion about how accurate are eyewitnesses. Because, you know, if you have a crime or something, they, they want eyewitnesses. And so what this program did, it said, we're going to show you the reenactment of a crime. And you watch very closely. We'll have some questions for you. So I watched closely. And afterward, they had some questions. Oh, he had on a white shirt. And then they started asking these other questions. I went, oh... I guess I'm not such a good eyewitness. I didn't catch that. And I misinterpreted that. And I didn't see that. You don't have to worry about this witness. It is God. And God says what? That He saw the wickedness of man was great. Great throughout the earth. Externally, man was doing wicked things, but inwardly, look, the intentions of his heart was only evil continually, or day after day after day. And 
God's anger is greatly provoked. This is the natural condition of men. They are wicked and they have evil hearts and they entertain evil thoughts. Now, some of you know, in the history of the church going back to the 400s, there were a couple of men who got into it by the name of Augustine and Pelagius. And Pelagius said, well, you know, man's not really that bad. Every man born in this world is just like Adam. He's a, he's a clean slate. And you say, well, why does he do such things then, Pelagius? Well, he just had some bad examples. He's just bad examples, and, and he's picked up some bad habits. But you see, man can break those habits. Well, I thought about that. And I, I confess to my great shame that middle teens on up to early 20s, I was a smoker, a very heavy smoker, two, two and a half packs of Lucky Strike every day. Well, the Lord saved me. I kept smoking. I, first thing I'd do of the morning, I'd get up and have a cup of coffee, cigarette, and read my Bible and pray. I just loved it. But then people started talking to me and saying, you know, you're, you're kind of hurting your witness here. And you need to consider your bodies the temple of the Holy Spirit. You need to consider the, the sixth commandment, you shall not murder. And so I was thinking about those things, and I thought, well, maybe. And then one day I was sitting in a chair smoking a cigarette, and my little girl got up in my lap, and she says, oh, Daddy, you stink. And I thought, my word, my daughter thinks she has a stinking daddy. So all those things, I decided I'll quit. I'll be honest, it was one of the hardest habits I ever had to break in my life. But I finally did. I broke the habit. Well, if you can break one habit, you can break any habit, can't you? Why do you need some kind of a special grace if a man can break these habits? Augustine says, wait a minute. It's more than just habits. A man is a guilty sinner... And in order to repent and be right with God, he needs that special grace that comes from God. Well, what about this, this matter of, of a man and, and his sin? Maybe if, if judgment comes, a little punishment, he'll quit sinning. Now, some of us who are parents, we've had to paddle the rear end of the little kid and We'll say, now, are you going to be a good boy? Oh, yes, Mommy. I'm going to be a good boy now. Well, how long does that last? Not very long. And so here we have this terrible judgment upon the world. And, and what happens? Did it change man? Well, you look at chapter 8, verse 21. The Lord smelled the smoothing aroma. And the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground for man's sake, although the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Here was a terrible judgment, but it didn't change man's nature. You look in Luke chapter 16, that rich man that was cast into hell, he's in torment, and he wants a little water. Well, did that torment change him? No. He wants to argue with the Lord and say, No, 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 the Scriptures aren't enough. You've got to send Lazarus back from the dead, and, and then maybe my brothers will believe. You see, he's still a rebel against God. Punishment, fire, doesn't change a man's nature. That says a lot for purgatory, doesn't it? Well, this man and his sin from his youth, and you remember what David said in Psalm 51 when he confesses? He said, In sin did my mother conceive me. Now, he's not speaking against or condemning sexual intercourse between married people. It is something God created for man's enjoyment, for the propagation of the race. But what is he saying? He's saying that as soon as there was conception... There was beginning to develop a guilty, polluted little sinner. I came out of that womb a guilty, polluted little sinner. 
That's when it started. At conception. Two sinners, what do they produce? Another sinner. Or as Jesus said, sinful flesh produces sinful flesh. And there are other scriptures that bring it out. You remember Jeremiah said, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. And if you're a Christian person, you know something about that. Are you not amazed at the deceitfulness of your heart? Oh, you can get by with it. You won't get caught. It's just a little sin. Are you not amazed at times the horrible thoughts you entertain? It's because you've got wickedness yet in your heart even as a believer. And doesn't Jesus bring out in these Gospels more than once? He says, for out of the heart... Out of the heart proceed these evil thoughts. Out of the heart is where all these crimes start. And God says here, I saw the wickedness. And then you have the Apostle Paul in that section, Romans chapter 1, where he brings out this matter of all that the people do. In the third chapter he says, there's none righteous, no, not one. There's none who understands. There's none who seeks after God. They've all turned aside. They've become unprofitable. There is none who does good, no, not one. And so man, in his fallen state, you see, his mind's been affected. The mind is opposed to God. His affections are turned. He just loves darkness. He loves his sin. And, and his will is a rabble against God. Now, sadly, there are some who say, yeah, man fell, but you know his, his will's okay. Now, this handkerchief, it's not been used. It's nice and clean here. And so there are people who say, yeah, the sin affected the man's mind and, and his affections, his heart. But this will is just as clean and pure as the snow-driven wind. There. It's nothing wrong with it. No. 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 The mind's been affected. It is dark and hates God. And the heart loves sin. And the affections love sin. What does mind and heart and affections equal? Will! You will not come to me that you might have life. But some think that will so free. Free to go right along with the rest of the nature in rebellion against God. Or again, I think it was last year down south, they were having those terrible tornadoes and people were being killed. And I remember reading one story. This, this house was destroyed. And they found a woman, she was dead. And they found others who were dead. But lo and behold, under some of the rubble, they found this little baby. The little baby was fine. It was alive. It was healthy. It was okay. Mother was dead. Others were dead. And that's the way a lot of people think about the will. Everything's dead, but boy, we've got this lively free will that can just jump in the direction of righteousness, jump in the direction of the Lord. No. The will is in bondage to sin. God says He saw the wickedness. He saw this wickedness. It was great. It was inward. The whole man, you see. And so man is depraved. All men by nature are sinners. And you experienced that this past week, didn't you? Do you have any run-in with sinners? Any who called you names or did this or cheated or lied or what have you? Any, any problem with sinners this week? What about you? I know you're in the process of sanctification, but there's a little bit of sin still there. For example, maybe this past week someone while driving just cut you off. What did you think about them? What did you say in your heart? Perhaps you said something out loud in the car you wouldn't repeat here. Maybe you gave them a little hand gesture that you wouldn't want to do that here. 
And you thought, you know, I'd like to run that guy down and beat him within an inch of his life. You did not do it. But it was in the heart. Man is a sinner by nature. That's what depravity has to do with. But we go on and we ask, well, really, 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 how bad is this man by nature who's a sinner? How bad is he? Well, I suggest to you that all men by nature can only sin against God. That's all they can do is sin against God. Oh, you say, I don't buy that. Well, I've seen some men do some real good things this past week. I saw a fellow help a little old lady cross the street in her walker. And I've heard about men doing heroic things, saving other lives. Well, it's not a matter of what you see or what you think or what you feel. What does God say? And I suggest again, the Bible teaches that fallen man can only sin against God. That's all he can do. Well, what about these things? We'll call them civil good. Well, we're thankful for that, but still, God sets the standard and God says, all the fallen man can do is sin against me. I think the Bible says something in Romans 8 that they who are in the flesh cannot please God. There's not one thing a fallen sinner can do to please God. And when we study our Bibles, we find, well, how does a man please God? Well, whatever he does, he has to do it in faith. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Whatever he does, he has to do it according to the revealed will of God, and he has to do it for a right motive, the glory of God. Now, a man might do the right thing according to the will of God if he saves a fellow man's life. He's upholding the sixth commandment. But did he do it in faith? Unconverted man has no saving faith. What was his motive? Was it the glory and honor of God that he did this? No. Yes, we see men doing civil good, and we profit from that civil good. We see men doing a lot of things. What drives them? I suggest to you it's the sin of pride. Men do a lot of things out of pride. They do great things, so to speak, out of pride in order to gain the praise of men. And it goes on in the church. You remember Jesus' condemnation of the scribes and the Pharisees. More than once, He says, they do what they do in their praying and in their giving and in their charitable deeds. Why do they do it? To be seen of men, to have the praises of men. And how can you believe, He said, who seek praises from men? Men do a lot of things out of pride. In history, there have been men Albert Schweitzer, he did forego vocation that would have made him a lot of money and he spent his life over in Africa helping the poor people. But he cast off the Christian faith. Pride drives men to get the praise of others. But yet we say men do certain things, good things, civil things. We see it, yes, Man yet does what is called relatively good things because he's still an image bearer. He still has the work of the law in his heart. And there is what we call common grace. That grace that restrains men. That grace that ennobles men. Has no saving quality about it whatsoever. It is simply God restraining men for the sake of the elect, ennobling men to do things for the sake of the elect. But God has no desire to save them. 
God has made all things for Himself, even the wicked for the day of judgment. And God creates men and God uses men as He so pleases and there's absolutely no sin or wrong involved in doing so. So yes, men do what we call civil good because of that common grace, because of the way they're put together. And whenever you've done any reading in this matter of man's depravity, you've probably come across two words, intensive and extensive. Intensive, extensive. Intensively, man is not as bad as he could be. He's just not as bad as he could be. Because God restrains. Because of civil authority. Because of parental restraint. Men are not as bad as they could be. And again, you can think of yourself, some of the thoughts you've had, and some of the things you'd like to do. But there was some kind of restraint there. But then extensively, everything about man, every faculty of his being, has been affected by sin. Everything about his mind, his heart, his affections, his will, everything. Everything. We just, he's a sinner through and through. Man by nature is opposed to God, the God of the Bible. Man is a sinner. And he is one who can only sin against God. That's where the, the total comes in. Total depravity. Well, why should we look at anything like this? I mean, is there just any benefit? I mean, people think, well, I'm just beating men up. Well, this matter of total depravity we consider because it is something clearly revealed in the Bible. It's set forth. But then there's something else concerning this matter of man's sinnerhood. It somewhat helps us to understand the world in which we live. It helps us to understand this society in which we live. Because perhaps tonight you'll go home and look at the news. And some of the things you'll hear that men have done. How could they do it? For example, it's been in the news lately about a father who built a special room and his own daughter, he shut her up and fathered seven children through her. And we'll say, what an awful, awful person. How could it be? Depravity. Total depravity. But for the restraining grace of God, you'd hear more things like that. But it helps us to somewhat understand Men do horrible things. And again, some of the thoughts you have had. What a heart we have by nature. And so it helps us to understand the world, the society in which we live. And we need to add to that the the wrath of God. The wrath of God is continually coming down upon wicked men. But then there's something else to think about. What about the great, great grace of God? For you see, by nature we are sinners. By nature we are the objects of God's wrath. And He saved us. He saved us who by nature are enemies. Saved us who by nature want nothing to do with Him. But in a sovereign grace, He set His love upon us and He saved us. He overcame us. He changed us. And so it helps us to understand the world in which we live and it ought to magnify greatly His wonderful grace. His wonderful grace. But then again, We think about this matter of man and his awful sinful state and we say to ourselves, well, it doesn't appear that 
many people believe it or many people are concerned about their sinfulness. Oh, that's absolutely true. Not many are awakened to their awful, sinful state. They're just fine. Hey, maybe I'll do a few things wrong. Big deal. And a lot of that can be laid at the doorstep of the church. The church seldom preaches the law of God. And the Apostle Paul said, by the law is the knowledge of sin. And again in Romans 7, he brings it out. I had not known sin except the law said you shall not covet. In other words, the law did awaken within Paul the fact that he had a heart full of evil desires. That he had a heart that was always desiring things contrary to the law of God. And for the Apostle Paul, he says, by the law, sin became exceedingly sinful. And until a person experiences the awfulness of sin, his own sin, he's not going to cry out for mercy. And if God the Holy Spirit with His law awakens a man, He doesn't need, as we say, the little little worker telling him to pray this prayer. He cannot help but pray it. And you've got so many in the church, a little tip of the hat to Jesus. Oh, I believe in Jesus. And they've never been driven out of themselves, their sinful selves, to cling to the righteousness of Christ. Easy believism permeates the church. Permeates evangelism. Why well, just walk down the aisle? You come to Jesus with your feet. If you can repeat this little syllogism to me, you're all right. Welcome to heaven, brother. Salvation is a work of God's Spirit, as we shall see. He awakens men and drives men out of themselves into Christ, and they cling to Christ. And one of the marks, and I say only one of the marks, that a true believer is growing in grace is the fact that he or she becomes much, much more aware of the sinfulness of his heart. What a sinner I am. And again and again looks to Christ and is thankful for what Christ has done and for the righteousness of Christ and for the sacrifice of Christ. The true believer continues to experience the exceeding sinfulness of sin. You say, well, you know, I'm really not bothered by all this. Very well could be. Very well could be that God's just going to leave you in your sins. He'll never awaken you. He'll just leave you. And that He will justly punish you for your sins. What should you do? Well, just out of self-preservation, you ought to ask God to awaken you. Tell Him the truth. You have no concern about your sin. But you have heard that He punishes sinners and He does so justly. God, might it seem good in your sight to awaken me, to convict me, to change me, to make me experience the exceeding sinfulness of my own sin and then save me through your beloved Son. Amen. Let us pray.
our Lord God indeed we are great sinners we thank you for disturbing our lives for driving us out of ourselves into Christ and oh God what great love you have had for us oh Jesus that you would suffer for us Oh, by nature we run from you. By nature we push you away. By nature we fight against you. But you've overcome us. For those who sit amongst us, who are smug in their sin, might it seem good in your sight to awaken them, to disturb them, to drive them out of themselves to bring them to your Son. And we shall praise you for your almighty grace. Amen.